Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you all are having an amazing day. I apologise for not being on camera for this video, I know normally it's Amy that isn't on camera, but a combination of factors, one, I'm finishing uh, photography for a couple of upcoming reviews, and second of all, as you can probably tell by my voice, I am dealing with getting over a cold at the moment, so, well, combination of factors and all. Anyway, we have several very interesting things that I'd like to discuss, the first of which concerns the first performance results, independent performance results, of the RX 5500, which of course is Narve 14 based, and will be seen in a plethora of forms, both the mobile version, the 5500M, the desktop OEM version, which is the subject of this, and the uh, AIB versions, which are going to be produced from companies like Sapphire, Powercolor, blah, blah, blah. Now, the 5500 that we're looking at has actually been procured from uh, HP. Heist.de, from what I understand, wrote to them and asked if they could have this card for uh, review purposes, and HP graciously accepted Anyways, we have a couple of different benchmarks that they've tested this card with. Uh, it's not an extensive test suite, unfortunately, but it does give us an idea of how the GPU performs. So this 5500 OEM card uh, is scoring 59 frames a second in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And yes, the fact it doesn't quite get 60 does make my OCD go nya just a little bit. Uh, meanwhile, the 580 Nitro scores 65 frames a second and the 1660 OC scores 69 FPS. And I'll grant you that those two cards do have a little bit of a leg up over the 5500 OEM. For example, the 1660 is an OC model, which is obviously going to skew the results a little bit in those cards' favour. The power consumption is also considerably more efficient with RDNA compared to Polaris. 133-7 watts versus 207 versus tw and slash 12 watts. That is, of course, uh, load and idle, uh, respectively. And I'll also put a link to videocards.com, who have put together this rather nice comparison graph here, uh, because heist.de did not put it in that form, so shout-outs to uh, Ycry over videocards.com for putting in this easier-to-read format. I'll, of course, link both of them in the description of the video, both heists and uh, video cards. Anyway, so there are several takeaways here. Uh, the first of which is that we will probably see faster performance for the non-OEM versions. In fact, the uh, GPU results that we've seen from AMD themselves put this GPU much closer to, let's say, a 590 in terms of performance. It's essentially supposed to replace the RX 590. Admittedly, the games that AMD themselves are testing are different, though. Uh, for example, if we look at uh, Borderlands uh, 3, the 5500 scores 82 frames per second, compared to the RX 480, which scores 69 FPS. In Gears of War 5, uh, 92 FPS, compared to 79 FPS of the RX 480, and so on and so on. The second thing we need to discuss is that HP's own website, from what Heist.de have said anyway, is actually listing this card incorrectly. In the model of uh, desktop that this will be featured in, uh, HP Pavilion TP010004NG, they specifically state it's a uh, 5300 XT. And once again, uh, Heist.de claim that this is incorrect, and it is actually a 5500. So anyway, at least we get some idea of how this GPU performs. It's not anything to revolutionize your gaming experience, but we didn't really expect it to do that. Hopefully, AIBs will be able to squeeze additional performance out of the GPU, and it's going to be interesting to see how it does compare against the OEM card, because to be honest, there is a little bit of confusion at the moment which, quite frankly, AMD are not doing anyone any favours with. They've been very quiet, honestly, on how they've handled the whole uh, 5500 launch. It's been one of the weirdest announcements, to be honest, in tech in a long time. In fact, just to add to this confusion, 
videocards.com I actually tweeted on their, well, Twitter account. That was the most redundant statement I could possibly have made. Uh, but anyway, on their Twitter account, they've stated that there is RX 5500 XT8 gigabyte models from Gigabyte. And those are quite, uh, quote, excuse me, very close. And once again, this does raise many questions of why AMD is so quiet regarding the XT. I've actually asked a couple of AMD representatives, and they've said that we're not even being secretive. We've just not been briefed in some cases. So goodness knows what's going on. And while we're on the subject of AMD, I'd like to bring your attention to Van Gogh which appears to be an APU code name for Apple. There's also references in this driver code for Nave 21 as well. This was discovered by Steve Moser over at MacRumors.com. Unfortunately, it's precious little information exactly what the architecture is. There's a lot of speculation regarding the specifications of this chip. Unfortunately, we can't really ascertain much given the code that we've seen thus far. Uh, a lot of people think that it's custom in design, which would make sense. And what we do know is it is going to be designed for Apple. Now, whether that's exclusively for Apple, we're not 100% certain, although I wouldn't be surprised if it is a custom design. And it's probably based around Zen 2, but once again, we're not 100% certain of that. We probably can guess it's Nave based But regardless of the specifications for a moment, this is a huge win for AMD. Because obviously, Apple are a massive, massive customer. Uh, and obviously, TSMC actually produce chips for both Apple as well as AMD. Although you would expect when it's being produced, in theory anyway, because it's a custom design... It would actually be produced on Apple's heart behalf, not uh, AMD's behalf. I'm going to finish the video off with some next generation console news, specifically revolving around the performance of the next generation systems. The PS5 is said to be more powerful than the Scarlet. And furthermore, the PS5 development hardware is more mature than what Microsoft are shipping so far with Scarlet as well. This is according to a Klee Game fan who has posted on Reset Era. He's pretty well known in the community and is pretty well respected in terms of next generation console leaks. He also adds that since software, not hardware, is Microsoft's area of expertise, it's very possible that they could deliver more advanced DirectX development software and, and allowing games to run better on Scarlet even if, quote, the hardware is less capable, end quote. Ultimately, we don't have enough information yet regarding the specifications of either console to call it, and early development kits aren't a great indicator of final production hardware. We saw Sony and Microsoft bump the specifications of their respective systems up last generation. Just prior to the system's launch, we saw Microsoft increase the GPU clock frequency, and by extension the ESRAM clock frequency as well, Sony, meanwhile, literally doubled the amount of GDDR5 memory inside the PlayStation 4. So, it's very much up in the air until the very last minute. There's probably a good chance the basic specifications are now down. They're not going to suddenly jump GPU generations, for example. But clock frequencies and that type of stuff, they can change almost up until the last minute. There's also... Very little information, solid information anyway, that's appeared in the public eye for the Xbox's APU. With the PlayStation, it's a very different story. We've seen Oberon and so on and so on. We know basically the CPU clock speed, the GPU clock speed. Assuming that stuff's accurate, and it looks very close to being accurate, Digital Foundry actually confirmed that the code names we've seen out in the wild, such as Oberon, are accurate, so... There's a very good chance that the APUs that have been tested are representative of the clock frequencies we'll see, at the very least in the, uh, in the development kits. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens, because I've been told that the Xbox Scarlet has more advanced ray tracing than the PlayStation 5. But the thing is, ray tracing performance does not necessarily equal to faster traditional graphics. It could be that... 
faster ray tracing just means that it's more efficient because maybe they've optimized the GPU a little bit more for ray tracing. So we could have a situation where when ray tracing isn't enabled, Sony's machine pulls ahead by 20, 30%, whatever. I'm just throwing a number out there. Whereas when ray tracing is enabled, Microsoft either equal things out or, well, pull ahead. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves and bye for now.